Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to SciShow Quiz Show, the only quiz show on the internet where I'm the shortest one. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Sorry. Could have made your hair go a little higher. <laughs> I just got it's a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your host, Michael Rondon. Today we've got a rematch between internet hotshot Hank Green and uh, really tall guy <laughs> Reed Reimers. With pig shirt. It's creepy pig. With pig shirt. <laughs> it's human teeth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, do you know that, or do pigs just have very human-like teeth? They don't have that human of teeth. You know a lot about pigs. I might be in trouble. <laughs> if there's a pig question. Yeah. Well, <coughs> Reed, you'll be playing for Carolyn Wolfram. Okay, Carolyn. Hank, you are playing for two people today. Oh. Sean McLennan and Jason Archibald. I will let you both down, or <laughs> possibly not. <laughs> I'll try not to. So the rules are, if you answer a question correctly, you'll get some number of points, and whoever has the most points by the end of the game gets to go home with some special DFTBA merch. Well, we don't, the people who the we're people playing for. The people for whom you're playing. Yes. Yeah. Stefan, what can our contestants take home today? Thanks, Michael. The loser of today's SciShow Quiz Show will take home the coveted I Lost at SciShow Quiz Show pin and the autographed scorecard that cost them the game. And today's winner will take home the I Won SciShow Quiz Show pin, the autographed scorecard that won the game, and a surprise assortment of DFTBA merchandise. So for round number one, we'll start off with something appropriate for our two SciShow hosts. You want me to throw the microphone? Is that what's... Okay, there it goes. Gone forever. Uh, so for the first round, we're going to start off uh, with 1,000 points each. Okay. Cool. I'm leaving now because I always end with less than that. <laughs> <laughs> and the topic of our first round is space. Space! space. Okay. <clears throat> Look around the solar system and you'll find all kinds of different bodies. Planets, dwarf planets, moons, and lots of asteroids and comets. These objects are sometimes classified by their composition or size, but sometimes they're classified by how weird their orbits are. Okay. And there's a special type of body that's found only between Jupiter and Neptune that probably came from a different, more stable orbit somewhere else in the solar system, but got tangled in the gas giant's orbits as they were passing through. Today, they're known to astronomers by the name of a mythical creature. Are these objects called A. Unicorns B. Manticores C. Griffins or D. Centaurs you know, I thought I knew the answer to this question, I but I too. sure don't. I thought it was chimeras. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go for uh, centaurs. Hmm, you are correct. Yeah! Oh, man. The answer is D. Centaurs. Centaurs get their name because they behave like a cross between an asteroid and a comet. We don't know whether the centaurs start out as asteroids, which usually orbit between the Sun and Jupiter, or comets, which spend most of their time in deep space. Some centaurs, like one called Chiron, actually have the same type of coma, or cloudy envelope, that a comet does, so they're classified as both asteroids and comets. Blind That's uh, 100 points for Reed. It's minus 100 points to Hank. Well, I get nothing. Is that how that just, works? Yeah, that's, you gotta guess, or you... Okay. You Pull lose, it together, Hank. You lose points no matter what. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't just give you 200 points. It's Shh, mathematically the same, don't need, don't need but it wouldn't hurt as bad. <laughs> <clears throat> Another odd thing about the centaurs is that their colors are so distinct from what we can tell. Some of them are red, while others are blue, and we haven't really found any in the middle ground. This has a lot to do with round number two. Okay. Colors! <clears throat> I like colors. <clears throat> the first question in this round is about the whole entire universe, so I hope you're prepared for that. <clears throat> in 2002, astronomers averaged together all of the light from 200,000 different galaxies, and normally if you combine all of the colors of visible light, you get pure white. But the universe has more of some colors than others, so when researchers found the average color of the universe, it wasn't exactly white. What was it? A, beige. Yes. A, beige. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A, beige. Uh, the other Negative 100. Possible, yeah, but now we're just back to where uh, we started. Big, okay? Yes, let's I know. Just be, let's just make this okay. Right. The answer is A, beige. If I had asked you this question a few billion years ago, the answer would actually be some shade of blue, because younger stars tend to be bluer. But as the universe has aged, more of its stars are yellow, so the average color of all of the stars is more of a lightish brown. Eventually, the color will shift to red, the color of the oldest, longest-lasting stars. Uh, speaking of yellow, <coughs> gold, the metal, not the color, is something we humans consider pretty valuable. Plus, it's useful in things like dentistry and electronics. But when you get down to the nanoscale, we're talking a billionth of a meter, okay. things get a little weird and its properties can change a lot. Gold nanoparticles are first manufactured as a liquid solution. But when they dry, they absorb longer wavelengths of light. So what color are dried gold nanoparticles? Are they A, bright orange, B, gold, C, purple, or D, green? I'm gonna go for purple. 
Mm, that's gonna that's gotta be wrong. You are correct. Oh, yeah. Man, you are so good at this. The answer is C, purple. Normally, gold is, well, gold colored because the metal reflects nearly all visible light, though it does absorb a little bit of blue and red, which is why it looks yellow. But when tiny particles of gold are dispersed in a solution, they reflect the red part of the spectrum. And when they dry, they clump together and the wavelengths of light they absorb shift. The clumps absorb the longer, redder wavelengths of light and reflect the shorter blue ones, so they look purplish. You get 100 points. Congratulations. Thanks. To you lose 100 points. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> For our next question, let's talk about blood. <clears throat> blood does lots of things, but its main purpose in the animal kingdom usually involves transporting oxygen. Since different chemicals can connect with oxygen and carry it around, blood can be all kinds of different colors. With that in mind, which of these is not a color of blood found in the animal kingdom? Ooh. Is it A, black, B, blue, C, green, or D, colorless? I'm gonna go for green. You're wrong. Oh. Do I, I have to answer in order to not lose points? Is how this works. Yeah, probably. I'm gonna go with black. You are correct! Hey! The answer is A, black. Lots of different animals, from octopuses to certain spiders, have blue blood. That's because where our blood uses iron-based hemoglobin to bind to and transport oxygen, blue blood contains copper-based hemocyanin instead, and hemocyanin is blue. But blood comes in green, too. One genus of skinks has green blood, and green bones. Found in Papua New Guinea, they're commonly called green-blooded skinks for a reason. They aren't secretly Vulcan. Their blood just contains a lot of biliverdin, the compound that's responsible for the green color of human bruises. It's also in their bones and muscles. And it turns out that some animals don't need any of these colorful compounds to transport oxygen, like the Antarctic ice fish. In 1928, a zoologist found a very odd-looking fish off the coast of Antarctica. And when he cut it open, he found that its blood was transparent. Researchers eventually learned that this ice fish's blood doesn't contain any hemoglobin, hemocyanin, or even red blood cells. It just transports oxygen dissolved in its blood plasma. But so far, we haven't discovered any species with truly black blood. Okay, we're moving on to our final round, which is that one time when you guys like Get to bid you, you bet some points and yeah, stuff. Thanks. The topic of this round is animal defense mechanisms. Hank really? has one thousand points. Reed has one thousand points. It is oh. neck and neck. Uh, uh, you guys can bet anywhere between zero and a thousand on your answer to this next question. Again, the uh, the topic is animal defense mechanisms. Do we pick our we pick our points now? Yes. While you do that, we're gonna go to commercial break. Welcome back. You guys ready? Yes. Animal defense mechanisms. If any of us were to meet an angry bear in the woods, our instincts might be to try to fight it or run away, but other animals get a little more creative with their defenses. Usually, these fall into one of two categories. Morphological defenses, which are bodily adaptations, and behavioral defenses, which affect how the animal acts. Now, the behavioral ones include things like living in groups, even though that means there's extra competition for resources, but the morphological ones tend to be more unique. So here are four morphological defense mechanisms, but one of them is made up. Which one of these is not a real way that animals defend themselves? Oh, a. Like this question. Breaking its own bones to form claws. B. Launching its feces two meters. C. <laughs> no more or less. <laughs> <laughs> one read length, actually. Yeah, exactly <laughs> this, uh, this far. <laughs> C. Shooting blood out of its eye, or D, spitting out its venomous teeth. Oh. Oh. Ooh. Oh. Oh my. <laughs> you seem Reed pretty seems very confident. Yeah, about just this. fake it till you make it. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I I also do not know. I know I know that a couple of those are things that actually mm -hmm. happen. So I, a couple of them. I have a 50-50 chance. Okay. Let's reveal our answers. That was the other one I was going to guess. 42? You I went with 1,000. Well, yeah, because I thought you'd lose. And even if then I lost, I'd still win. <laughs> well, <laughs> Skank, you are correct. Yay! Oh! Yay! <laughs> 2,000 points for him. You've got, uh, what, 958? Yeah, which I think is still pretty good. It's good. It's, it's, it's less than half of what <laughs> I have. It's not the lowest score we've seen here on SciShow Quiz Show. No. What breaks its bones to make claws? That's I've, bananas. I'm Who sure I'm about to tell teeth? everybody. I, oh, are you about to tell them right now? 
The answer is D, spitting out its venomous teeth. When attacked, the hairy frog will turn its toe bones into claws by contracting a muscle that breaks them. Then it forces the sharp tips out through its skin and, you know, swipes. Scientists aren't sure where the claws go afterward, though they think the bones probably just slide back in afterward and eventually heal. As far as poo-flinging creatures, some caterpillars can launch their poop up to two meters. It takes the form of these little pellets called frass, which first just sort of sit there on a little pad inside of them. Then they build up blood pressure beneath the pad to bring the frass away from them. And that's important for these caterpillars because wasps are attracted to the smell of caterpillar poop. So getting the stuff as far away from them as possible is a useful trick. And for shooting blood out of their eyes, some species of horned lizard will respond to threats by increasing blood flow to their heads and stopping it from leaving. Eventually, blood vessels around their eyelids break and the blood streams for up to 1.5 meters. And finally, while there are animals that spit out venom, none of them actually spit out their teeth. Fascinating. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, Glad okay. I explained that oh, so that well for everybody. Right. Yeah. Woo, I win! <laughs> for you, people whose names I've forgotten. Sorry, Miss Wolfland. Wolfram. That's what I said. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow Quiz Show. If you want to see more of Reed, you can go to SciShow Space. Also, if we reach $25,000 a month on Patreon, we're sending Reed to space camp. I really want to go to space camp. <laughs> I'm really excited to go to space camp. So help us make that happen. Help and don't forget out. to go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe. Bye. Bye.